Yes. Anyway, I'm going to let everybody in and we'll give this a start. No, you're not. I'm going to let everybody in. Okay, you let everybody in then. Thanks. We'll, we'll just sit and squabble. <laughs> you just sit and squabble, yeah, that's fine. And then I'm going to disappear, like I normally do. Hi, everybody. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And my screen's frozen. No, it hasn't. There we go. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am delighted that we can offer this session for you. It's a bit of a special. It's on a, a different day to usual. Um, but it's a really useful session. This is going to tell you what you need to know about the apprenticeship levy and how you could potentially tap into that to uh, be able to recruit learning support staff for your school because we know lots of you are struggling with that for September and throughout the year to be fair. So I uh, um, was approached two years ago to write the apprenticeship programme for United Learning, which is a, a very large multi-academy trust. Um, so thank you very much, United Learning, for approaching me for that. They then managed to get me on board to deliver their programme for them, uh, which I am still doing. We're about to launch our third cohort. And I have asked Ella to come along today to explain what the apprenticeship actually is, because I think sometimes we, we hear it, we kind of know it, but we don't know enough about it. So this is your chance to find out about it and to ask your questions and have your questions answered. And hopefully between us, Ella will be able to answer everything for everybody. I shall hand over to you. Thanks, Abigail. I'll just pop a couple of slides up. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me at this session and great to be here with you all, although I can't actually see any of you, but um, good to be here and I hope I can um, give you some really useful information to take forward today. So as Abigail said, um, I work for United Learning. Uh, my name's Ella Howard. I uh, am a project manager in one of our central teams, so I essentially run the operations for our training provider. Um, United Learning, as Abigail said, is one of England's largest schools groups. So we've got around 90 schools uh, across England now, and they encompass both uh, academies, primary and secondary phase, as well as independent schools. So that's quite unique in the sector. I don't think there are any other trusts that also have independence. Um, so we've got a really good understanding of uh, what it's like to be a member of staff in lots of different types of schools. And crucially, we're an employer of thousands of support staff across the country so we really do understand the training needs of um, TAs and lots of other different types of staff. Um, as well as being um, uh, a multi-academy trust we decided to set up our own training provider back in 2020 as Abigail said. We've now been running um, our, our apprenticeship program since 2021 so we started in the height of lockdown um, running things online and that's gone really well so we're now hoping to grow and offer our programs out to a larger number of schools all across the country. So you might know a bit about apprenticeships um, and I've heard about the apprenticeship levy since that was reformed in 2017 um, but there are some kind of myths and it's a bit mystifying about how it all works so I'm hoping to give you kind of in a nutshell what it looks like and how that could impact both your recruitment TA roles and also upskilling of existing staff. So if you work in a school that's part of either a large multi-academy trust or part of a large local authority, the likelihood is that your school pays a significant amount of money into the government's apprenticeship levy pot. So that's sort of like an extra tax that schools pay every month to the ESFA. Um, and then you can claim that money back for apprenticeship training and it's solely for apprenticeship training it's not for any other type of cpd it's just for apprenticeships and if you're unsure if your school pays this levy then go and speak to your school business manager or someone else if you're in a trust it could be the trust finance director or someone in your hr team they should be able to tell you whether you pay the apprenticeship levy and if you do they'll be able to tell you how much money is available in that pot that's left to spend on training so if you are a levy payer, then apprenticeship training either for existing staff or new staff is essentially free. 
because it's paid for through the money that you've already got available in the pot, provided that you haven't already spent all of it. Um, that's quite unlikely because if you're part of a trust, you've probably paid millions into the pot over the past few years and likely haven't sort of maximised apprenticeship spending. So you probably have um, a few hundred thousand pounds left, if not millions. Um, that's definitely the, the situation that we find a lot of trusts and schools groups, groups in. So um, there's loads of money to play with here and it, it's kind of a no brainer to spend um, the money rather than paying for other types of CPD externally. So we offer level three programmes, but there are lots of other types of apprenticeships available for all different types of staff. Generally, they're from levels two to seven. So level two being equivalent to GCSE level, level three being equivalent to two A levels, going up to four, five, six, and then eventually seven, seven being equivalent to a master's level or a postgraduate qualification. So there really are now apprenticeships available for almost every type of occupation, every type of job, um, all types of level um, and anyone can do an apprenticeship. There's there's no age limit. And I'll say a bit more on kind of some of the myths that you, you might have heard about apprenticeships later to try and debunk them. Um, and the key thing with an apprenticeship is that it's a real job with training attached. So an apprentice um, is an apprentice contractually. Uh, so they have a norm normal employment contract, they have to have a minimum rate of pay, um, but the difference is they spend a proportion of their working hours doing training. Now this had been 20% of their working hours, that had been the rule since 2017. The ESFA has literally just changed that as of last week. Um, they've they've changed, they've, they're moving away from a 20% calculation, so previously someone who worked 37 and a half hours a week, so a full-time contract, had to spend at least seven and a half hours a week on off-the-job training, so at least a day a week on off-the-job training, and that is training away from their normal job doing the learning. So that could have been attending college or doing something online, doing an assignment, etc. That's just changed, so now it will be a baseline minimum six hours per week for every apprentice no matter their working hours um, and that will change and anyone that you put forward for our autumn cohort that's what it will apply um, but that's the key thing with an apprenticeship is that it's a real job with the real wage but with training encompassed within the working hours and the expectation there is that unlike some other CPD programs the learner is not expected to complete the learning in their own time. So they won't have to do any learning in the evenings or weekends. It's designed to be um, an opportunity for people to learn whilst they earn. So it's supposed to be more accessible. Now, if you are part of a trust or you're a standalone school or part of a single academy trust that doesn't pay the levy, and that will only apply if you fall below a certain threshold so essentially if your employer has an annual wage bill of less than three million pounds you can do the maths on how many staff you might have to have to be below that threshold but it's going to be quite small but if if your employer pays less than three million pounds annually in wages then it's unlikely that you will pay the levy however if you don't pay into a levy pot, the government will still let you access the funding to pay for apprenticeship training, either to upskill existing staff or recruit apprentices, because they're so keen to get people doing apprenticeships and get that as the way to get people into work. And they are really keen to get staff in education doing apprenticeships. So they will subsidise 95% of the cost of each apprenticeship, even if you don't pay into the levy. So as you can see from that example there, it turns out to be a really sort of like a no brainer, super cost effective way to train your staff or recruit people and train them up on the job. So the standard cost, and this is a centrally government set cost, the standard cost of the TA apprenticeship is £5,000. So that's not something that we as the provider make up, that's set by the Institute for Apprenticeships, which is a government body. That's the maximum cost. If your school pays the levy, then that programme is free because you're paying for it through your existing levy pot. So no money to your school budget and not to the learner. 
if you're not a levy payer, then the government will pay £4,750 of this with the remaining two fifty pounds only needing to come from your school budget. So it's a really cheap way to uh, upskill or recruit whether you're a levy payer and you get it completely free or not. Um, so it is really kind of literally a no brainer compared to lots of other CPD programmes that are on offer for teaching assistants. So a bit more about the teaching assistant apprenticeship. So we've been offering this programme since 2021. It's a level three programme, as you can see. So as I said, that's equivalent to two A-levels, um, but that doesn't mean that someone has to have already achieved an A-level qualification to do it. And I'll tell you a bit more about entry requirements in a second. Um, so it's generally 18 months long. Again, that's a standard length set by the Institute of Apprenticeships, but that can fluctuate slightly depending on uh, where the apprentice joins and their prior learning and prior knowledge. But generally it's going to last 18 months. And I should say that an apprenticeship legally can't last less than 12 months. So any apprenticeship will always be 12 months long or longer. Um, some of them can be up to five years if they're a level seven, but generally level three apprenticeships are about 18 months long. Our programme is delivered via a blended flexible model. Uh, so we operate on the basis of delivering two face to face days. So that's one at induction at the start of the programme that gives all of the apprentices a chance to meet our team and to build relationships with their peers on the programme who will then support them as they go through their learning. So one induction and then a further one about halfway through, so six to nine months through the programme, we have a second face to face day. The rest of the programme is delivered completely online. So um, that will be either Abigail delivering live webinars or the apprentice having a one to one tutorial with Abigail, or it could be group sessions with other apprentices or independent study. So that could be research, it could be completion of tasks, um, finding examples of things they're doing in their day to day job and then doing a sort of analysis and reflection on it, submitting that and then also assignments at the end of each unit. But it's completely flexible as apart from those two face to face days, it's all done online. So the only thing that the apprentice needs uh, is the off the job time to complete the work in and a computer ideally a, a laptop or a PC rather than um, a mobile or an iPad, but essentially a device where they can go online and have a working mic uh, and camera. So really that's kind of a minimal requirement that you should be able to fulfill in your school. Um, there's no traveling, there's, there's no, aside from the two face-to-face -face days, there's no traveling each week. There's no money spent on travel or time wasted traveling to a college so it's really flexible um, and we can deliver to schools anywhere in England because of that predominantly online element. And as I said, um, the, the off the job requirement is kind of a key part of the apprenticeship. So that is now a minimum of six hours a week. Um, there are some kind of differences if someone works part time where we extend the length of the programme, but everyone now will be doing a, f a baseline of six hours per week of off the job. So um, that does mean off the job. So it doesn't mean they can be sort of have one eye on their computer on learning whilst they're supporting a student, it really needs to be properly off the job. So that's just something to think about if you're you're thinking about this for your team is making sure that you've got the flex in your team to be able to allow someone to have that time and really focus on the learning. Another benefit of the apprenticeship programme and something that the government are really committed to is developing numeracy in English, um, numeracy and literacy skills through apprenticeships. Um, so because this is a level three programme, um, if an apprentice joins and they haven't already completed level two or GCSE English and Maths, or they can't evidence prior achievement of that, then we will support them to gain those qualifications for free as part of the apprenticeship. So uh, we put them onto an online study programme and we give them some extra tutor support to get them through that. Um, and then they have to complete that past the exams before they can go through what's called the gateway to end the apprenticeship. So that could be a real benefit, benefit for some of your um, colleagues if you know that they don't have their GCSE English and Math 
maths, this apprenticeship will help them get that. And then hopefully that increases their job prospects going forward. So we are currently taking applications for the autumn intake of our teaching assistant program. Um, our deadline to apply is the start of September, so you've got a bit of time for any sort of movement you've got within your TA team between now and then. Um, and as a provider, we take new cohorts in every spring and autumn. So if you're not quite ready to put anyone forward for autumn, we'll have another round coming up to start in spring. I'm aware that some of you might be working in primary phases, um, so if that is you, we also run an early years educator level three programme, quite similar to the TA programme in terms of um, what it covers, equipping assistants or nursery nurses that are working in the early years to deliver the best kind of support and create really inclusive environments um, within those settings. So. Um, I'll tell you how you find more information about that um, if you are interested at the end of the presentation. Um, but those are kind of our two support um, apprenticeships that we run at the moment, which hopefully might be useful for some of your schools. Again, we're taking an autumn intake next, so taking applications um, this term and up until the start of September. So a bit more about who is eligible. So as I've said, um, their apprenticeships can be used to upskill ex existing staff um, or recruit new staff. And actually, since we've launched, we found it's a really popular route to upskill existing staff. In particular, you might have TAs who've been um, in the role for a few years, but they've never done any formal training or kind of um, deepen their knowledge on the theory or pedagogy of supporting a diverse range of students, in which case this programme is probably going to be really beneficial to them. The only kind of stipulation when it comes to eligibility is that an apprentice can't already have a qualification at the same level as the apprenticeship they want to do. So this won't be right for your TAs if they already have a level three in a teaching assistant qualification or a qualification that is very similar to a teaching assistant. So there are a number of different level three sort of supporting teaching and learning qualifications out there. This might not be right for them if they've already done something like that and they're quite experienced and you're quite confident that they have a sound understanding of how to support their students effectively. However, that's not always clear cut, so we do always say it's best to apply and we can kind of help you judge that because someone might have, for example, a level three or a level four or a level five qualification in business support or accounting or something like that. In that case, they might have chosen to check chosen to change their career and actually their previous qualification probably won't have any relevance to this apprenticeship and then we can use the apprenticeship funding to put them onto this program. So that's the main thing to be aware of is if you've got colleagues who have a significant amount of experience and you're really confident in their ability and understanding of how to do their role really well, this might not be right for them. And if they already have a level three in something very similar, this is probably not right for them. But if they don't have a level three and you think that doing a training programme could really build their knowledge as a TA, i.e. they've got quite a lot of progress to make, then this probably will be right for them. So um, if in doubt, put someone forward, we'll check their application and we can kind of help make, make that assessment for you. So that's for existing staff. Um, the other benefit, which I think not enough schools really know about, and uh, it's really, really great, to be honest, is that you can recruit someone into an apprentice role. And that's a really, really cost effective way to bring someone in and upskill them on the job and make them behave in the way that you want them to in your school and um, you know, sort of build the team that you want um, with the skills that you need for your context from scratch. And it's very cheap. Um, so I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Um, but sort of key message in terms of eligibility is someone who's already got a level three in a teaching assistant qualification, 
probably not going to be eligible. Someone who is very experienced and you're really confident in their ability, probably not going to be eligible because we can't use this money to accredit existing knowledge. We can only use the apprenticeship funding to uh, fund the acquisition of new knowledge, skills and behaviours. So that's something that we have to evidence to the ESFA um, when we take people on is that we've done that assessment and we're clear that someone is really going to move on quite considerably with this programme. They're not just going to get a qualification for stuff that they already know. So a bit more about recruiting apprentices. Um, so if likely you might have some TA vacancies coming up now or likely to come up in the next sort of six weeks for September. Um, before you rush to just put out the same advert that you normally do for a TA, stop and think, could we take on an apprentice into this role? And I'd imagine the answer is quite often yes, unless you're looking for someone with lots and lots of specialist experience. Um, and the thing with recruiting an, an apprentice is that it's really cheap and there are lots of potential apprentices out there, both who are school leavers who are looking to get into a career in education or people that maybe have done something else and are looking to change career into education, they might also be looking for an apprenticeship. So because there's a minimum um, apprentice rate and that apprentice rate is, as you can see there, just over £9,000 a year. So it's tiny. Um, and to be honest, I would always suggest that you offer to pay much more than that to a TA because it's sort of criminal how low that is. Um, but that's the national minimum rate that an apprentice has to be paid by an employer. So if you agree to recruit someone as an apprentice and then train them with us, we can advertise your role for you, your vacancy on the National Apprenticeship Service. That's sort of a large government database jobs board that's offered for employers to advertise their apprentice roles. That board is really good because it gets exposure to thousands of potential apprentices and employers um, so it will be like used very often and looked at by um, lots of school leavers lots of kind of careers guidance agencies those types of um, agencies wanting to get people into apprentice jobs so that really opens up your pool of applicants it will get you a much more diverse pool of applicants than you might normally from just a standard vacancy that you post on your website um, it's free and if you want to train someone with us then we can advertise that for you so um, either through the apprenticeship service or you know you have your normal recruitment process with your school or your trust where you put it on your website and then we can get a link up to that via the apprenticeship service and get it advertised and pushed out to thousands of potential applicants um, so I would as I said I would advise that you do offer much more than the minimum apprentice rate for a TA um, but potentially you could get two or three apprentices for the same price as you might, you know, a very experienced, one very experienced TA. Um, so do have a think about that. It's a really cost effective and efficient way to fill some of your TA vacancies. And if it is something you're keen to do, then please get in touch and we can help you with getting that advertised. So I'm hoping I have um, answered quite a lot of questions, um, but there always are lots of different frequently asked questions with apprenticeships because, as you can tell, there's quite a lot of rules and they're quite complicated. Um, and if you have end this session and you are really interested, which I hope a lot of you are, you'll obviously need to go and speak to your head or a member of SLT about how you can make this work and to be honest they might be the group of people who take the most persuading about why you should use apprenticeships either for CPD or for recruitment so hopefully here I can help you with some of those answers if if your head does challenge you 
and they cover a lot of what I've already said, but to reiterate. So you can use an apprenticeship to train an existing member of staff. They don't have to be a new recruit. They don't have to be a 16 or 18 year old that's just left school and doesn't know anything. Those are very much the apprenticeships of the past. Um, apprenticeships now are very different and the government has really moved to professionalise them and make them available to all different types of people in the workforce at all different levels. So do always consider an apprenticeship as the first route to upskill your support staff because it's likely that there's an apprenticeship available and it's likely that you're a levy payer and therefore it will be free. So you won't need to worry about any of that money coming out of your school budget, which we know is always a challenge. Um, I should also say, I did mention earlier, but an apprentice themselves can never be asked to pay for any of their apprenticeship training. So it's always going to be free to the learner and very often free to the school, but an apprentice can never be asked to pay for any of their training. That's um, a stipulation of the rules. And as I said, anyone of any age can do an apprenticeship. There is no age limit to who can do an apprenticeship. So someone who is still in the workforce or wants to join the workforce age 80 could do an apprenticeship, providing that they don't already have the same level of qualification as the apprenticeship they want to do. Um, so it, they're not just for school leavers or young people. Um, and staff can do an apprenticeship even if they've got a degree or a postgraduate qualification or, you know, they've got lots of different qualifications. Again, the same rule applies. They just can't do an apprenticeship at the same level as a qualification that they already hold. So apprenticeship can actually be a really good route for someone that has decided to change career and is starting from scratch. But has quite a lot of other knowledge and experience um, because it's a way for them to train whilst earning money. And as I said, um, you might have heard about apprenticeships, you know, people going to college one day a week, they have their college day. That is sometimes the way apprenticeships work. It's not the way our programmes work. And generally, lots of apprenticeships are now moving towards a more flexible online delivery module uh, model. Sorry. So and that is how ours works. We we do it pretty much solely online. So it's really flexible and schools can use it in a way that suits them. So um, in those six hours a week, you know, you could say to your colleague, I'm giving you three hours on a Monday and three hours on a Thursday, or I'm giving you the full six hours on a Tuesday. And actually, because you're going to be doing your off the job time, you don't need to be in school, so you can do it from home if that works for you. So there is a lot of flexibility in this now. Um, and there's no there's not really any money wasted on traveling or time wasted on traveling, which we know is a real benefit to schools. Um, this should already be covered if you're upskilling existing staff. An apprentice must have been resident in the UK for at least three years, so they are only available to residents of um, England, but that should, should already be covered by your employment T's and C's. Um, and then the other thing that I touched on, which is something that as educators working in schools, we need to think about because we know timetables are so stretched and resourcing is so stretched, is that if you are considering taking on or putting at least one person, if not several, onto an apprenticeship in your team, do think carefully about whether you've got enough flex in your team to cover their off the job time. So we know it's going to be a minimum of six hours a week off the job. If you're working in a really small department where you've only got one or two TAs, you've got to think really carefully about how you're going to cover their time to make sure that your pupils are still getting the experience that they need from your support team. So that's just a note and you'll know your context and we can work with you to kind of work out how um, how you you organise that, but just do do think about whether it's kind of realistic to have an apprentice because you do have to keep up with that off the job commitment and we have to evidence that, etc. So it is a commitment. So final thing from me before I um, let Abigail tell you a bit more about the curriculum. So next steps, hopefully you've listened to this and thought, yes, apprenticeships sound great and we can definitely make use of them. And I know we've got loads of money available uh, or even if you don't, you can still access them and 
save a lot of money on your CPD. If you do like what you've heard and you want to know more, then please do take a look at our website. Um, the link is there and I'm sure Abigail will send that out. So you've got the direct link. The website has got our prospectus. It's got a summary of each programme. Um, it's got FAQs that I've some of them I've been through, but that should have all the information you need before you kind of take the decision to put staff forward. So please do take a look at that. Um, next thing, if you're really confident that you definitely want to put staff forward for this is to um, share the information with your staff first of all, so they can hopefully have a look and think for themselves if they want to do it. But then identify staff in your team who could be eligible and who could be good candidates for this. Um, talk to them about it. Make sure they've kind of understood how an apprenticeship is different to another type of CPD programme. For example, all the training is during their working hours, so that's going to slightly change what their day to day role looks like. And it's going to mean they're have, going to have to be quite disciplined about saying I need to do my off the job time now. So no, I can't go and help with that student or no, I can't go and do break time duty, etc. So do you just make sure that you're all aware what the apprenticeship will actually entail and obviously come back to us if you've got any queries uh, and then crucially do speak to your head about it or whoever your CPD lead is and just make sure that they understand the apprenticeship but also how valuable this can be um, and how cheap it is. Then there's a quick um, application form on our website. So we would advise that your colleague themselves does that because there's quite a lot of personal information. If it's someone that you're recruiting, so they're not yet in post, um, we can work with you to do the application for the apprenticeship at the same time as the recruitment so that you don't recruit someone who wouldn't be eligible. So you just get in touch with us um, if you've got any of those. And then once we've got applications in, we do a sort of desktop analysis to make sure that they they meet those eligibility requirements. So crucially, how many hours are they employed for? Are they on a permanent contract? What sort of job do they do with you? Um, what qualifications do they have already? And if all of those things look fine, then we'll invite them and either you as their manager or whoever else their manager is will invite them to what we call a professional discussion with Abigail. That's where we get a chance to really understand why they want to do the program, how it would work, how they think it would benefit their role in your school and then baseline their level of knowledge so that we can create their bespoke individual learning plan. And that plan is then what dictates exactly what their curriculum will look like, exactly how long the programme will take, how many hours they'll spend on it each week and, you know, what they want to get out of it and where they want to end up. So what are their career aspirations and how will this programme help them get there? So once all of that's finalised, we'll then send some enrolment paperwork, which has to be signed off by them, us and the manager. So that could be you. Um, we'll do that all by September and then the induction for this cohort will take place just before half term in October. So that will be kind of split between a little bit of online orientation um, and then a face to face session. And the face to face session will generally be either in London or in Manchester. So that's it on input from me. Um, I can see there's been loads of questions coming through in the chat. I know, Abigail, you've been answering them, but if there's anything else you want to highlight that we haven't covered, can you um, perhaps read them out to me, Abigail? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think it would be um, useful to kind of just cover them anyway. So we had, um, can the off day work be a fixed day or does it need to be flexible training? So just in case anybody can't see the questions, I know that some of you join us from a mobile phone. Um, there does have to be an element of fixed to it in that there is a live part. So the webinars and the group discussions have to be fixed. They have to be timetabled for the October cohort. This is going to be a Monday morning from nine till eleven. But what I have to say is it is not every Monday morning. So if they are a typical apprentice in quote marks, the programme lasts 59 teaching weeks. So of those 59 teaching weeks, 27 of them have a uh, live session, if you like. 
the other four hours of that week they can do whenever they want or not not literally whenever they want within their working hours so there is a degree of fixed but not totally fixed we do record our sessions so if there is you know for example this week we've had exams going on quite a few of my secondary cohort haven't been able to join us they've let me know we've recorded the session they then watch it back when they can and they will um, reflect on it they'll send back a reflection there is an expectation that they will catch up with that within the same week though because otherwise they start to drift away from the rest of the group um, so it's, it's asynchronous and synchronous learning at the same time. Do they get holidays? Yes, this is a term time only. So we cannot ask an apprentice to do anything in their weekends, after school, holidays, anything like that. It has to be done within their working hours. We know that some of them will go and do a little bit of extra reading, but we can't count those hours towards their off the job. That has to be within their working time. The, um, only, the only exception to that is if they're doing maths and English. So if they're doing level two functional skills as part of their programme, then that's not part of the off the job time. It's additional. So we do ask that they are given some time within their working week to do that. You know, it might be half an hour, an hour a week, but they can complete that in their own time to speed it up and indeed a lot of them really want to get it done quickly so they will say right I'm going to do you know I'm going to sort of blast it this weekend or over the holidays to get it done so uh, yeah that's the only part that kind of is designed not to be done additionally to the working hours but with the actual apprenticeship standard content it's really important that they do get the time within their working hours to do that because that's um, a stipulation of the funding absolutely sorry i didn't make that clear thank you ella um somebody asked about the recruiting advertising i think you answered that really clearly i didn't realize you could advertise it for them so that's uh, that answers that question that keeps being asked in the facebook group where can i advertise for ta vacancies here you go agree to do an apprenticeship and you can advertise it via the uh, apprenticeship network yeah so, uh, so we essentially give um if you come to us and say we want to recruit an apprentice, we want them to train with you, what we'll do is give you sort of a one page of performer, which asks for all of the information that the apprenticeship service wants. Um, that will you can take most of that from your standard job description. So it's you know, it's not much work to do. You send that back to us. We get it up on the service and link it to us as a provider. The SFA then reviews and approves them and then it goes up onto the service within sort of 24 hours. So, um, yeah, if you're going to do that, I'd advise sort of planning ahead. So leaving at least a few weeks to get uh, the vacancy up and give it time to get exposure. And that system also has analytics so we can see how many people have seen the vacancy how many people have read through it how many people have clicked on to the apply button um, and we can either get potential apprentices to apply via that database so via the apprenticeship service or they can just apply through your normal recruitment system so we'll just put a link to your vacancy on your website which works really well and i would say that um places like job center when they have their their people coming in for the credits and the, and the rest of it they do send out that database i've seen it sent out before so we know it's going out to people that do need jobs or are looking for jobs um it, it's a pretty good place i've been asked could we have a copy of the schedule training for the year I will share a rough plan. We'll attach it to where we uh, attach the recording of this. I haven't actually written October's plan yet. I have to get that signed off by Ella and her team just to make sure I've done it correctly. But just to be clear that every apprentice's calendar will be slightly different because of the very nature of the fact that every individual is different. So I can share a rough calendar with you which I will do but just bear in mind it is only rough it will be tweaked for each individual so some for example somebody may have a bit of prior knowledge in my unit five and I may not be doing six weeks with them they may only be doing four weeks on that particular unit um, somebody else may need to do a couple of extra weeks for whatever reason on unit one so it, it can only ever be a rough plan that I share with you in terms of that 
Pathways after the apprenticeship, could somebody then move into a teaching qualification? Um, it, it is the equivalent of two A-levels, so presumably they would need an, an additional bit of an A-level to get into a degree. So yes, they could move up to a undergraduate qualification. Ellie, you have teaching um, teacher apprenticeships, don't you, through United Learning? So there is the teaching role there, but they do need a degree first before they can join that. Is that right? Yeah, so the national requirement for access to teacher training is that um, trainees have to have a degree, but there can sometimes be flexibility on that depending on the ITT provider. So as you said, Abigail, United Learning does have its own ITT provider. It's called United Teaching, been established for about seven years now. Um, and we now run the level six postgraduate teacher apprenticeship. Um, so, you know, there is potential that if you have a member of staff that does this TA programme, they then get the level three, then do some further qualifications, um, you know, level four or above, or decide to move into a foundation degree and then get that degree, then yes, they could go on to start some teacher training. It's a bit more of a, a longer route, um, but that that is possible. Unfortunately, nationally, there isn't kind of a process whereby a TA can fast track it to become a teacher, which is a shame. Um, hopefully the, the DfE will kind of look at that at some point. But uh, yes, th this could kind of set someone up on a journey to becoming a teacher or to becoming a level four higher level teaching assistant or to uh, taking on a specialism within a support team or eventually becoming a SENCO. Um, so it's a really good kind of springboard to lots of different routes within education support. So um, outside of United Learning, there are level four courses available that will take just those two, the equivalent two A-levels to allow people onto that level four. So I, I, ironically, I just signed up for one, which is a child development and psychology one at level four, which um, you can study um, after this one. Just to reiterate what Ella said, though, if they've already got a qualification that is similar to the content of a teaching assistant role they wouldn't be eligible for this apprenticeship they they would need to look to that higher tier already that said i interviewed somebody yesterday professional discussion she has got a degree she actually has an undergraduate degree in film studies there is no overlap whatsoever with the teaching assistant role that she is going into in September. So she is the perfect person for this. She's going to do the teaching assistant role for two years. The school have employed her on that basis. And then she is going to do her teacher training after that. So she's using this as her stepping stone to get there to kind of give her that experience with the students, if you like, and just make sure that it is the right route for her. Um, is there an assessor needed in the school? Absolutely not. No. And what is the commitment if that's in involved? OK, let's just talk mentors here. We call them mentors. Um, it, it's usually the line manager. It doesn't have to be. It's the person that's going to be the support for the teaching assistant whilst they're on this programme. So we do ask you to nominate somebody who is going to take on that role. There is a little bit of work involved. I'm very sorry. We can't make it all disappear for you. You are our eyes on the ground. This is a remote programme. I don't come into your school. I don't see those apprentices. So I have to know that what they're putting on a piece of paper and submitting to me is what is actually happening in the school. So we do ask for observations. There are 11 modules the way we've designed it. So there are 11 observations across the course, across the programme, if you like, over the 18 months. We also ask you to commit to having regular meeting with the TA just to check that everything's OK, giving them a bit of support, a bit of guidance, pointing them in the right direction of where they might find things. Um, and we also ask that you attend what we call progress reviews. So roughly every four to six weeks, we have a, a progress review where we just check that everything's going to plan. 
do we need to rewrite something for them? Do we need to set some different tasks? Do we need to take a different route? Um, is what's happening what we expect it to happen? And we ask you to be a part of that. But that's kind of just joining in with a, a bit of a chat with me and with your teaching assistant with you. If you call them LSAs, that's absolutely fine as well. I just stick with teaching assistant because my mouth can't manage lots of different phrases. I'm sorry. Um, where will the induction and the further session take place? As a, you typed that perfectly timed, Louise, because Ella said it just as you were typing it. Um, London and potentially Manchester uh, for those two venues. The London venue is lovely. It overlooks the Shard. Please come there. Please, 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 please. Anyway, um, as a boarding school, our terms are slightly different is that a problem absolutely not we have got uh, independent schools and boarding schools already on the program and uh, they yes you tend to break up slightly earlier the way I've kind of tailored the program is it accommodates that for it so no not a big problem uh, not even a small problem to be fair we're used to kind of working with that and organizing that and then I haven't read the bottom one, sorry. Do I know specifics linked to local areas? As I know that all local authorities do send an EHCP differently, although I appreciate this is probably a small element of the course. Um, that Because it's an apprenticeship, I may teach them, for example, um, the graduated response within, within the SCN code of practice but it's for them to go and find out the local context of that pretty much the same as we deliver a unit on safeguarding but for me it has to be generic because I'm, I'm working with people who are down in Cornwall in the middle of London up in Manchester even further north I've got somebody from Cumbria tomorrow um, so I have to do it generically but their own work their own contribution to that makes it more specific to their local area so that's where it becomes um, far more valuable than actually attending a college course where it's where they're kind of quite blinkered in that respect if you like they do get that freedom I just want to say that our course um, some of you will already have apprentices and may have actually experienced this before we um, provide pretty much everything so in terms of the um, research that they have to do we will direct them to which website the content for them is actually already written it's a bit like having a ta handbook if you like or a book that tells them what to do and we deliver it unit by unit um it's they've not got to go and find that for themselves and we know that that is something that other apprentices have struggled with because they 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 find it's it's a little bit too wide and they don't really know how to focus in on it. So we've really honed it down for them and said, okay, here you go. This is what you need. And if you want to branch it off, you can do. But here's some suggestions of where you can go. Uh, answer the question. Yeah, yeah. Needs a good local offer website. Yeah, you definitely need a good local offer website, Louise. I I know where you are as well, though. You've got no chance. Um, okay. Any other questions, or have we answered everything? I'm not sure. I, I might just to explain how the the end bit kind of works for everyone. I suppose the apprenticeship is. Um, two, there's 18 months. It, it's almost two years before they go through the gateway. They um kind of study their bits as they go along they generate a portfolio that portfolio has in it 11 pieces of work that summarize everything that they've they've learned throughout this we submit that portfolio to an endpoint assessor which is why you don't need an assessor in school the endpoint assessor has a look through that they then contact to come and do two things first thing they're going to come and do is an observation of the apprentice in school so they come and observe them and then they'll have a Q&A session with the apprentice so that if you know if they're not very good at um, um, expressing themselves in writing it doesn't matter so much because they can do it verbally instead um, and then they also have a 90 minute discussion with them about their portfolio so the portfolio those 11 assignments that are in there that they are supported through we, we guide them through them we make sure they hit the criteria they will sit and talk about the, that portfolio and the assessor will 
have a professional discussion. So it's not a Q&A. They're not going to say, do you know who your safeguarding officer is? They will probably pose it in a manner of um, if there was a safeguarding incident in your school, what is the process that you would follow? And the apprentice can then talk about their work. We know that not all um, of the applicants for this or everybody that's involved in it is brilliant at writing essays. We do have to submit the essays. We do have to submit the portfolio. We do have to submit that evidence so somebody has got something to work from. But it's that opportunity to demonstrate it visually. They, they're actually going to do the job and to talk about their job. And we know that actually they are much better at that. There you go. That was my bit I wanted to add to it. Um, and a good local offer. Slides, yeah, the video will be shared. Thank you. And thank you, Helen. Yes, definitely something to look into. So as Ella has said, we are recruiting for the October cohort. Um, we call it the October cohort. It's the autumn cohort. Um, deadline 9th of September. That's quite a tight deadline if you're going to recruit people. So, you know, get moving now but we do also have a march cohort as well so if you um don't manage to get somebody in place for september or you want to give them a chance to get their feet under the carpet we have got another cohort in the spring term if they start in the spring term it actually means they go through and theoretically they finish just before the July of the following year um, in terms of their learning content. So if you're looking at how does that work in, in terms of a contract, they would need to have their contract go over the summer and into the September, October. They would be finished around about October time. Um, and that's something just to bear in mind that their learning period, the, the 18 months that we're talking about, doesn't include the gateway, which is a bit at the end of it. Um, so just just have a look at that when you're looking at contracts. Um, and I don't think it's unfair to say there was another school I spoke with on Monday. They've actually recruited to the apprenticeship position. So they've advertised it as an apprenticeship. They're taking somebody on. And what they've done is they've gone down the route of saying, OK, you're, you're starting in October on the apprenticeship, but we'll start you in September so you can get a feel for our school and we will give you a minimum two years contract. And if we need to extend it, we will do. So that's that's the route that they've gone down. There you go. Any more questions? Because you have got Ella here. You have got me here. More than happy to answer anything you want to know about this apprenticeship programme at the moment. An idea of the modules are included. Yes, I can. There are. Um, well, let me just explain the standards first of all, because that makes more sense. There are five knowledge standards, five skills standards and five behaviour standards that they have to fill. So in the knowledge, you have got understanding how children learn and develop um, technology, working with teachers to understand and support assessment for learning curriculum and keeping children safe in education. So their knowledge units is that underpinning information. As you can probably guess, I do a fair bit of work on Vygotsky and psychology and that kind of thing and underpinning. And we also talk about um, so United Learning use Rosenshine's principles. So Rosenshine's principles get sneaking to the curriculum part. And we do all of that about how we can do scaffolding learning and those things. Um, in the skills units, we are covering developing strategies to support and encourage pupils to move towards independent learning. I was doing that one this morning. Um, communication and teamwork. So being able to work as a team, working with teachers to accurately assess, which links to the um, knowledge unit around working with teachers to accurately assess. We have one on using technology, which links to the knowledge unit on technology. And then we have a problem solving and ability to motivate pupils, which links to that independent learning unit as well. And then in terms of behaviours, we have um, building relationships and embracing change. So that's all about relationships and behaviour management, which is so invaluable. Um, adding value to education and the way we do that one, we actually do it through a project. So rather than 
um, everybody doing the same thing. Everybody does something that is relevant to their role, very specific for their position in their school and what the school actually needs. There's no point on that one doing something that I've set that I think will be valuable, but it adds absolutely no value to your school and your students. So it's adding value to education is their project. It's what they want to do. Um, we do promoting equality, diversity and inclusion, which is um, uh, one of our behaviour units, which is the unit that I'm about to deliver actually to our uh, cohort that's started in March. There is a unit on professional standards and accountability, personal accountability that kind of overarches everything. So we start it in the very first week and we kind of let it trickle along as we go. So it's all to do with keeping your CPD profile up to date, any additional training that you access, um, how you've had a professional discussion, how you've challenged, not challenged, how you've met any challenges along the way. Say, for example, a tricky parent that you've had to deal with. So they would record a reflection on that and that comes under professional standards and personal accountability and then the final behavior unit is teamwork and collaboration and engagement and that one kind of links back to that skills unit around communication and teamwork um, I do it across 11 units as opposed to 15 units because some of those can be kind of clustered together we start with the really interesting unit, which is understanding how pupils learn and develop, because that's the, the, the really meaty unit. You have, have to know that before you can start working with children. And I have to assume that some of these apprentices have never worked with children. Some of them will have, but some of them I have to assume haven't. So we start with that one. It's all about child psychology, child development. Um, we get an education psychologist to come and talk to them. Really interesting unit unit. Uh, that's actually also our longest unit. It takes roughly 60 hours in total to actually um, study that unit. Our second unit is keeping children safe in education because they've all done it and they should all do their, their keep, you know, kicksy updates and all the rest of it. We have to do it as part of the apprenticeship, but it's not the most interesting unit. I'm just going to be honest out there. I can't make keeping children safe in education interesting. I'm sorry. It's a little bit sensitive. So we put it in fairly early on because it's very, very important. Make it as interesting as possible and then move on. Um, and that one takes about four weeks to do. Um, and then we move into promoting equality, diversity and inclusion, because most of us here, we're talking our SEN pupils. This programme, the TA programme can be used for those um, TAs who are working as general in-class support. And it can also be used for those who are working with EAL pupils. But those three units are the three that kind of embed the whole ethos of a, a TA. They are what a TA is, understanding how the children learn and develop, keeping them safe and then promoting the equality, diversity and inclusion. Everything else then builds on that. So we then move into relationships, um, behaviour, working as a team, knowing the curriculum, knowing the curriculum is different in every school. So it can come a little bit later. Um, my first cohort is currently doing the technology unit because we started during lockdown. We made the assumption they could do technology um, and left that till the end. So it comes towards the end. And then just before we get right to the very end of it, pretty much I'm going to say it's the last unit. It is technically the last unit. That professional standards one goes all the way through it, threads through everything, start it in the first week, pick it up in the very last two weeks. Um, but just before that, they do that adding value to education project, that that unit that is their unit. And it builds on everything that they've had throughout the whole programme. There you go. That was a, a summary of the units in one go. They, I hope that was helpful, Ellis. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll get um, Gavin to pop a screenshot of the units onto the uh, details for you as well. Would I recommend this for an SEMH Pro struggling to attract candidates? Yes, if their personality is correct, 99% of being a TA is getting the right person in front of the children. Getting them the qualification comes second to that, doesn't it? So, Yes, you could. Um, 
that what you would be doing with this is you would be upskilling them in understanding what the role actually is. Your most important thing, though, is, is this the right person that I've put in front of those students? Um, and we can, again, you know, I think you've just heard me say, we tailor it. So if you have got an SEMH PRU, if I've got an SEMH PRU person in front of me, we're going to be picking on their expertise when we're talking to the other TAs that are within the group as well. But we'd also be looking at how we can support them. So the, their units, that, that behaviour unit actually, which comes, you know, week 19-ish during the programme, we might need to move it earlier on for them because they need to build relationships before they start doing some of the other things. So we can we can tweak things slightly to suit those individuals. Um, yeah. I was about to ask if doing an apprenticeship would hold on to TAs for those that struggle to hold them. Um, that's my husband asking that question. Thanks, Gavin. <laughs> yes, it does help you to hold on to them because we know that, you know, you've got TAs in your school and at the moment they, not that you undervalue them because I very much think that you don't undervalue them, but they probably feel undervalued. They go along to an inset day at the start of term and it's all geared towards teachers. They go along to a staff meeting or a CPD meeting and it's all geared to what a teacher needs to do, not necessarily towards what they need to do. And I'm, I am generalising there. I'm pretty sure that some of you do deliver something bespoke and individualised to them. But as a, as a relatively underpaid member of staff, investing in their professional development, which is what this is, is invaluable. We have got individuals, so Ella said, you know, um, they're not always 16 to 18 year olds. My first cohort, their average age is 46. Um, they are an older cohort. They are a group of individuals who don't necessarily have qualifications. And this has given them the chance to go, OK, I am worthy. I am worth this. And my school believes in me and my school recognises that. So, yes, I do think it helps to hold on to some of those staff who might otherwise be thinking, why on earth am I doing this for a pittance of a wage? I might as well go and stack shelves in Morrison's. Um, it's less stressful. It just gives them that opportunity to do something. Ella might disagree with me, but that's how I feel. <laughs> No, I completely agree. And the confidence that we see building in our apprentices and the 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 change and how they talk about themselves, their abilities, their confidence in their skills, the impact they make in the classroom. And indeed, their managers reflect that and echo that. That is kind of the best part of the programme is taking someone on. They start and they're really kind of unsure of themselves. They haven't studied in a long time. They think, oh, my goodness, there's so much written work to do. You know, it's very academic. I can't do it. And we with the support, we show them, of course, you can do it. You're doing this job already. This is just going to help you understand better why you're making the decisions you're making in the classroom, how to make uh, better use of other education partners, the teacher in the classroom, and they just grow so much in confidence and really believe in themselves as professionals. And that is is completely worth it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, and it, it keeps them as well. Then they're, they're not going to quit because you've invested in them. Um, and, and that's the most important thing. There you go. So any more questions from anybody? They're still hovering. I've still got a large audience. We're doing quite well. <laughs> but any more questions from anybody? Really helpful. Fantastic flow. I hope you can take that one back to your management and, and be able to do it. Ella, I've actually got a question. It, 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 it came about while you were talking. What happens if a school has run out of its apprenticeship levy? Do they have to wait or can they access something else or what happens? Yeah, I mean, it's very unlikely that would have happened unless you've got someone in your trust or in your school who is being very strategic about spending the levy, uh, which we don't normally see, to be honest. Um, so in the unlikely event that you've run out of your levy, um, you can still access the pot from the government. Um, and sometimes you can do what's called um, 
so you can ask another larger employer that's got levy left over to pledge money to you and then you can use that to spend on your apprentices um so yeah if you go to your business manager and find that they say we've got no money left in the pot again i don't think that will happen but there are still options for you to access the money um and use apprenticeships there you go Flo. i think that answered your question from earlier on so we might still be able to help you out there um thank you miss tolly i think it's amanda tolly i'm not sure um and then louise following on from that what happens if they leave part way through okay so if they leave part way through and their new employer is willing to continue to sponsor their uh, apprenticeship time then we can continue with them on the apprenticeships so they can still continue on and get their qualification if they move to a new employer and that employer does not want to honor the apprenticeship time then unfortunately they have left part way through that's it's as, as simple as that i'm afraid um we have had that happen actually and the, the the ta left because of the confidence that the course had given her and she was devastated that she wasn't actually able to finish the apprenticeship because her new provider her new employer wasn't able to accommodate that um there's there's no clawback of funding though if that's what you're worrying about louise not from you anyway um we're not going to come chasing you and say oh you've got rid of that person so you don't need to worry about that and I should also say in terms of like flexibility, if, you know, something happens with your apprentice, they need to take some time off work, they go off sick, they have a baby, etc. Um, there is flexibility to take what's called a break in learning from the apprenticeship. So that's where any absence over and above four weeks, we agree to pause the programme, they take a break. You know that could be for six weeks three months a year to be honest as long as we can make it work they agree to come back when they're ready and then they come back and we extend their program to account for the time that they've had off so um there is flexibility in the program just like with any other kind of training program absolutely and that's why i couldn't answer the person earlier who said can we have the calendar of the events because it is different for every individual that's on that program OK, with no further questions, then I am going to pull this to an end. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. Isla has got her contact details on screen. I am biased. I do think it is a great programme. Um, that said, even if I wasn't delivering it, I think it's a great programme because United Learning have really put their eggs in the basket here and, and, and gone to deliver something that is valuable for everybody so it's certainly worth looking into as i said all the recording and any of the resources we will pop up for you probably pop it on the website because it's easier to access and uh hopefully some of you will be able to uh, send some tas in our direction for support for this year um definitely talk to your head teachers and uh business managers and your tas because it has to be the right thing for ta as well and i just want to say this is not and some of you will know what i mean by this this is not a mickey mouse course okay we are not going to be doing here you go here's your online content answer six questions here's your certificate this is a proper qualification not mickey mouse there we go <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I'll let you all drift out of the room. Ella, if you want to hold on for a moment. <laughs> Louise knows Thanks exactly everyone. what I mean by that. <laughs>